The theme which unites ancient Samaria to Darwinian scientific humanism, Big Bang assumptions, Luciferian theosophy, liberal theology, occult New Age mysticism, and all other anti-Christian, but specifically anti-creation, ex nihilo movements is the myth of evolution. The myth of evolution stretches back to antiquity, where it closely connects to the idea that man is a being who, though presently limited in time and space, is nevertheless capable of achieving a great leap of being and evolving into a much more powerful godlike being in the future. Thus in the Epic of Gilgamesh, an epic poem from Babylonia, Gilgamesh describes himself as two parts god and one part man, as the result of the evolution of his being. Long before Darwin, Greek nature philosophers were teaching primitive evolutionary concepts, natural selection, transmigration, reincarnation in vast ages together with many other modern assumptions. The fragments of Anaximander show that he taught that humans originally resembled another type of animal, namely fish, while Democritus taught that primitive people began to speak with confused and unintelligible sounds, but gradually they articulated words. The Greek atomist Epicurus, the father of contemporary materialism, and many of its modern assumptions, taught that there was no need of a god or gods, for the universe came about by a chance movement of atoms. Darwinism affirms that the claim made by Epicurus that living beings created themselves, making Darwinism a modern Gnostic myth. Says Dr. Wolfgang Smith, physicist and mathematics professor at Oregon State University. As a scientific theory, Darwinism would have been jettisoned long ago. The point, however, is that the doctrine of evolution has swept the world, not on the strength of its scientific merits, but precisely in its capacity as a Gnostic myth. It affirms, in effect, that living things created themselves, which is in essence a metaphysical claim. Thus, evolutionism is a metaphysical doctrine decked out in scientific garb. It is a scientistic myth. And the myth is Gnostic, because it implicitly denies the transcendent origin of being. For indeed, only after the living creature has been speculatively reduced to an aggregate of particles does Darwinism transformism become conceivable. Darwinism, therefore, continues the ancient Gnostic practice of deprecating God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. It perpetuates the venerable Gnostic tradition of Jehovah bashing. With respect to long ages, Plato and many other Greek philosophers taught that the present universe came about millions of years ago. Writing in the 4th century AD, Lactantius said, Plato and many others of the philosophers, since they were ignorant of the origin of all things, and of that primal period at which the world was made, said that many thousands of ages had passed since this beautiful arrangement of the world was completed. After the Greeks, the Roman naturalist Pliny the Elder, said we are subject to chance, that chance herself takes the place of God, she proves that God is uncertain. Greek and Roman philosophers received these ideas from ancient Sumerians, Egyptians, and Hindus, whose nature philosophies extended back centuries before Greek and Roman civilization. For example, one Hindu belief was that the Brahman, the void or universe, spontaneously generated itself is something like a seed or singularity about 4.3 billion years ago, and then evolved under its own power by which it expanded and formed all that exists. These Hindus believed in an eternal universe that had cycles of rebirth, destruction, and dormancy, known as Kelpas, rather than oscillating Big Bang theories. We also read in the Hindu Bhagavad Gita that the god Krishna says, I am the source from which all creatures evolve. In India, the doctrine of evolution, reincarnation, karma was thoroughly established from ancient times. It was expounded upon first in the Upanishads, the philosophical mystic text held to be the essence of the Vedas. The idea that the soul reincarnates is intricately linked to karma, the idea that jiva-atmas pass from one plane of existence to another and carry with them samskaras, or impressions from former states of being. These karmic impressions on the soul are taken to the next life and result in a causally determined state of being. In some schools of Hinduism, liberation from the cycle of death and rebirth is considered the ultimate goal of earthly existence. Other traditions assert that the liberation from samsara is merely, merely the beginning of a real spiritual life and beyond nirvana. Activities continue, but are no longer of a worldly nature. 
both sides agree on the phenomenon of evolution and reincarnation. In its modern version, Darwinian evolution describes the progress or transmigration of energy as it emerged out of a spontaneously generated matter, or chemicals, and its successive incarnations within the bodies of different kinds of non-life-bearing and life-bearing beings over the course of millions and billions of years. Its counterpart, spiritual evolution, bespeaks the progress of spirit, or divine spark, as it reincarnates within the bodies of different beings over the course of millions and billions of years. In the words of emergent church leader Rob Bell, evolution is energy. Quote, a spark, an electricity that ever, everything is plugged into. The Greeks called it Zoe, the mystics called it spirit, and Obi-Wan called it the force. This energy, spark, and electricity that pulses through all of creation sustains it, fuels it, keeps it growing, growing, evolving, and reproducing. For mystery religion, initiates and adepts, evolution spiritually transforms man into superman. The evolution of man into superman was always the purpose of the ancient mysteries, and the real purpose of modern masonry is not the social and charitable purposes to which so much attention is paid, but the expediting of the spiritual evolution of those who aspire to perfect their own nature and transform it into a more godlike quality. And this is a definite science, a royal art, which it is possible for each of us to put into practice. W. L. Wilmhurst from The Meeting of Masonry Evolution is an animated energy, serpent power, or force, which may or may not be divine depending on whether it is of the secular Darwinian school of thought or its spiritually pantheist counterpart. In either case, this energy usually emanates from an impersonal substance from which antiquity has been known variously as the void, chaos, ground of being, and Brahman. Now, just like the Gnostic mythical concept of evolution could be demonstrated to have originated long before Darwin, the mythological concept of a heliocentric universe can also be shown to have risen long before individuals such as Copernicus were credited with popularizing it. The Gnostic origins of a non-stationary Earth take us back to the figures of Philolaus and Pythagoras. Most sources credit Philolaus as the one who came up with the model of the Earth, Sun, and Moon all rotating around a central fire in the universe, while others claim that Pythagoras held to this idea even before his student. Either way, what is absolutely undeniable is the extremely Gnostic and esoteric footing on which both these men stood. To most of us average folks, Pythagoras is presented in school as an ancient Greek mathematician who gave us basic proofs such as the famous Pythagorean theorem regarding triangles, where a squared plus b squared equals c squared. To occult adepts, however, Pythagoras is understood to be one of the most revered of ancient mystics and mystery school teachers. Said to have been consecrated to the god Apollo before even his birth, Pythagoras was reared un under the tutelage of teachers such as Thales and Anazimander at Miletus, but as a young man he found himself unsatisfied by their seemingly disparate and contradictory forms of Gnosticism. He set out to find a more synthesized and universal truth, and allegedly traveled through most of the great civilizations at the time, visiting the priests of various mystery schools in places like Egypt, Babylon, and Chaldea. He basically combined all the occult knowledge he could gather from the world in his day, and then eventually settled in Croton, Greece, where he started his own mystery school, and developed a system of initiations and degrees, training through aestheticism, the majority of which was embedded within a complex code of numerical values and derivations. Thus, a vast amount of the concepts found in occult numerology and sacred geometry, which have filtered down through the centuries to our own time, can be traced back to Pythagoras himself. Freemason Albert Pike says in Morals and Dogma, Pythagoras refused the title of sage, which means one who knows. He invented and applied to himself that of philosopher, signifying one who is fond of or studies things secret or occult. The astronomy of which he was taught was astrology. His science of numbers was based on Kabbalistic principles. Everything is veiled in numbers. And truly, the further one might look into the beliefs and pursuits of individuals such as Pythagoras and Philolaus, the more it becomes plain that these were not simply individuals preoccupied with a rational and scientific analysis of the natural world, as our secular education system so often portrays them. Indeed, Pythagoras is revered by Plato and all the famous Greek philosophers who came after him. And in that light, we can understand just how pervasively Gnostic all of Greek philosophy truly is. 
how it was seated and guided not by the imaginations and musings of speculative men, but by the doctrines of demons as they were passed down through mystery tradition and ancient secret societies. Is it any wonder that occult brotherhoods such as the Freemasons have such a high regard for Pythagoras? Is it at all surprising to discover that his mathematical codes and numerological interpretations of the universe, such as the Tetractus, are interwoven throughout Kabbalistic and Masonic symbolism? And so from afar, when we step back and consider that neither Darwinian evolution nor Copernican cosmology are based on authentic scientific observation and experimentation, but rather on presupposed philosophical assumptions, it should also come as no real surprise that the ideological roots of both assumptions are practically the same. This only makes sense, really, because there is a rather obvious interdependence between the two. Darwinian evolution can't really be conceived of outside of a massive, ever-expanding, self-creating universe. A recognized geocentric cosmology would, would reveal the true absurdity of evolution's basic premises. At the same time, the limitless expanse of the Copernican cosmos are offered as the last great challenge for humans to conquer in their evolution as a species. And so there is an undeniable symbiotic relationship between these two assumptive maxims, which we are all inculcated with from the earliest age. Both are designed to shape our perceptions of human origin and human destiny alike. What is so interesting about looking at the example of Pythagoras, and the whole of Greek philosophy really, is that it can almost be said to be the first example of esoteric occult knowledge being taken and formulated in such a way so that the uninitiated were still being given a version of the teaching on a level which was merely mechanical and non-spiritual. Greek Gnosticism is really where the ideological division between matter and spirit started, the false division between physical and ethereal, mechanical and mythical, scientific and religious. It's actually a basic tenet of Gnosticism, which pits the material world against the spiritual, rejecting the biblical concept of hell and Hades and replacing it with the physical reality itself. So indeed, Gnosticism contains an esoteric and exoteric exposition for everything, which has more or less been the template of all occulted information ever since. I believe this very much applies to our own time, where these Gnostic doctrines have been quite meticulously repackaged into forms which genuinely believe themselves to be wholly materialistic, empirical and scientific. So many adherents of evolution today are staunchly materialistic in their worldview, completely oblivious to the fact that their beliefs stem from intensely religious and mythological beginnings. Currently we can see philosophies at the core of evolutionary theory propelling the agendas of things like transhumanism and the constant rebrandings of the New Age movement. The teachings of the occult realm have always sought to pervert the created order of the world and obscure the true identity of the creator. As Blavatsky said, at the head of our solar system is the solar logos, working with the lords of the rays who control the energies that affect consciousness and spiritual development of life forms. These have become known as ascended masters, and they are supported by other ascended masters beyond the scenes, as it were. It is from this sobering perspective that I am unable to sympathize with the notion that the flat earth debate is a distraction, which is a complaint I have now heard countless times from various individuals who seem convinced that there is nothing of substance to the sudden ignition of this online discussion, and view it all as some intentional diversion from the enemy itself, himself. I concede that indeed it could be a distraction, in the sense that anything could be turned into a distraction, if it becomes the sole focus, eclipsing the gospel of salvation itself. However, I would say that it could only be reduced to the inevitability of a distraction if such investigations were indeed shown to be utterly and entirely unsubstantiated. If the Flat Earth claims are instead shown to have real merit, however, then it would make about as much sense to dismiss it from the Christian standpoint as it would to casually ignore the debate surrounding the theory of evolution. If evolution is not a scientific fact, but only a horrific satanic lie being propagated since ancient times, and now in every official institution of our modern world, then the subject itself is not a distraction, because it is a lie from the pit of hell, intended to lead men and women away from the Creator, and it has to be addressed head on. The question of the Earth and the cosmology of the universe as a whole is no different, because it cannot hardly be separated from the other question. It is all quite plainly surrounding the question of origins and destiny.